Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Talking About My Generation. My name is Harsh Mal and I'm coming to you live from New York City. When we started the show, I would look forward to Saturday and to talk about a topic that I'm curious and passionate about. Since then, we've also had some really amazing guests whom I have had the honor of hosting and all of you have had the pleasure of listening to. But you know, now what I have started looking forward to each week is the fantastic questions comments and feedback that follows each episode of our show not only here on facebook but also on our slack channel and through whatsapp messages that each of us get personally so please keep them coming because i kid you not they really take the discussion in each episode to the next level as always do stay tuned at the end of today's show for a preview of next saturday's episode but for now on to today's show Our topic today looks at the world of deep tech and quantum computing from the perspective of pursuing a career in the sciences. Today, more than ever, we need the power of science and innovation to solve the complex challenges facing humankind. Healthcare being the most pressing example. And our guest today sit at the very forefront of this technology. So please join me in welcoming the mother and son duo Amrita and Shamik Chaudhary. Hi guys, how are you doing? Hello. Hello. Doing well. A little bit about our guests. Uh, Shamik is a fourth-year undergraduate student at Yale and a researcher at the Yale Quantum Institute. Quantum computing is amongst the hottest new areas in frontier science today. And as a 21-year-old, Shamik sits in the middle of this action, connecting three different worlds: the labs at his New Haven campus at Yale. the charged environment of rigetti in silicon valley and the coding schools collaboration with ibm where he is helping develop a course for high school stem students his mom amrita chaudhary pursued her engineering degree at iit kanpur before heading to uc berkeley for her masters in materials engineering amrita holds seven us patents in semiconductor manufacturing she saw the growth of the semiconductor industry from close quarters as it moved from the lab to commercial applications and in turn revolutionized the communications and computing industry in the 90s and today as an entrepreneur in the deep tech space she is a close observer of india's approach towards new technologies such as iot and ai i for one i'm really looking forward to their conversation i know that the chaudhrys are going to take a look at how interest in the sciences can be converted into opportunity and hopefully into a career So I'm going to hand it over to you guys now. Shamik, I know that you're currently in India as well, uh working remotely mm-hmm. with your colleagues in the US. So what has that experience of remote working across multiple time zones been like? Ah, uh, well, it took a took a bit of adjusting at the beginning, but I think now I'm used to it, I think. Um I also had even before the lockdown some experience working remotely. Um when I was working for Rigetti that was um basically remote since january and so i guess i had some practice with being able to collaborate collaborate over long distances but yeah it's definitely very new and kind of needs some getting used to indeed like you know we're all having to adapt in so many different ways even uh here at work and everything else right but today shamik and i are very excited to speak uh on a topic that interests both of us which is uh frontier science and deep tech and we'll be covering three uh broad areas today one is just the opportunity space around tech the other one is how to consolidate your interest in these uh areas and finally like you know how do you spark interest like you know and um so uh to begin with shamik we are living in these really fascinating times where science is being mm-hmm. increasingly called upon to solve like you know these really uh big challenges that we have in society and um mm-hmm. right like you know like uh, what's your take on that uh yeah i mean i i generally agree with that um i with covid-19 i mean i i, I guess we we've seen firsthand the needs and and scientists and i guess in that in that department also improve our like vaccine development capabilities um but even i guess like more broadly um most of the biggest problems in the world um we had like clean energy and climate change uh designing new sustainable materials um 
AI, artificial intelligence, space travel. I mean, all of these things are kind of pressing and they all lie in this realm of kind of the intersection of deep tech and, and frontier science. And so, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, I think science is kind of uh, the need of the hour. Yeah, like, you know, even in our company, Gaia, like, you know, there's a lot that mm -hmm. we are doing uh, to look at uh, this whole uh, remote and contactless uh, operations for uh, uh, companies, which is like, you know, again, an area of interest in this uh, post Corona world and looking at this hyper local mm -hmm. uh, delivery of services. Um, and one of the key mm -hmm. ingredient technologies underpinning it is uh, AI. And that also is one of those right. areas which is seeing a huge uptake right at the moment um, and mm -hmm. uh, around the world, but also especially in India. Like you know, India is one of the few countries which has uh, an AI policy at the government level, and there is a huge amount of funding and institution building that, um, like you know, is uh, uh, at least like you know being thought of and uh, spoken about uh, in the AI domain. And that's the same with quantum, right? Like in you know, India. Um, just announced the budget for quantum. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I did hear about that actually. I think it's close, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's close to I think a billion dollars, I think it was, um, which is almost as much as the US is investing in quantum through its national quantum initiative. Um, and other countries are also kind of getting in on it, China, the EU, uh, Canada. So, I mean, there's like a huge push and like a lot of excitement towards kind of developing this quantum science and technology. Um, yeah, really a lot of hype. Um, and I guess for that, uh, for that reason, a lot of people are calling our times the uh, second quantum revolution. So what was the first? There's a lot of hype right now for sure. Mm -hmm. What was the so first, the uh, first quantum revolution? Uh, the, mm -hmm. So the first quantum revolution was actually the initial discovery of the theory of quantum mechanics in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so the, the discovery of that physics in turn led to uh, a host of technolo technological advances. Um, it gave us devices like the atomic clock, um, the laser and uh, the transistor, which I mean, as you know, um, that led to all of modern electronics and computing, um, GPS devices, anything you need a laser for, um, be it um, communication networks or uh, LASIK surgery, I don't know. So these are all like profound inventions that have changed human life. And they all came out of kind of this first basic understanding of the theory of quantum mechanics. And so now um, what people are trying to do is actually harness the, the power of, of quantum mechanical systems for information processing. So they're developing these um, these quantum computers and communication networks and things like that. Um, and quantum computers actually have a lot of promise um, to be able to solve some fundamental problems in computer science, um, physics and chemistry. So you know, being able to um, well, actually do vaccine development or simulate drugs at, uh, at a molecular level. But I mean, other things too, like cryptography, optimization, even ML, like you said. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, there's a lot of hype and a lot of promise, and I think it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Absolutely, absolutely. Like, you know, it's really fascinating. And uh, Sushamik, uh, like, you know, is this, uh, uh, do you intend to continue working in this area? What do you think? Um, I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a really exciting time to be in quantum at the moment. It's at this like very interesting, like pre-commercialization phase where it's kind of transitioning out of, out of the lab and kind of into industry. And so, um, yeah, I mean, companies like IBM, Google, Intel, they're all, I mean, investing a lot and they all have like these big quantum labs that are researching this stuff. Um, and I also, I mean, I, I also got to kind of see that up close um, so when I was working at Rigetti, which is a quantum computing startup. Um, I kind of got to meet these people that are kind of doing breakthrough science and actually working on building quantum computers that are available on the cloud and can kind of perform basic algorithms already. And it was, it was really cool, I guess. So um, yeah, definitely um, 
yeah, it, it feels nice to kind of be, be in this space at the moment. Yeah, and I guess like, you know, once you see the big picture, it really gets you uh, excited about the whole domain. It's a little bit like uh, being in the midst of history as it's uh, being made, right? Yeah, um, actually, it's, it's funny you said that. Um, so I was, uh, I was recently reading this book, uh, The Innovators by Walter Isaacson. And there he's kind of profiling the kind of development of the information age. And um, he kind of does a biography of some of the pioneers of the the first computers, um, 1930s. And um, it's really cool to read about that because back then, um, I mean, this was happening in the US, but you had the government that was actually partnering with uh, research labs at universities kind of around the country and uh, around the world. And then also big companies like IBM, which still existed back then. Um, and they were all kind of coming together to develop the first computers in the 1930s and 40s. And so in a sense, I mean, that kind of excitement of kind of things coming together, it's pretty reminiscent of what we, what we see today. Um, and just like that environment is very conducive to innovation and, and growth and kind of doing science that leads to technology and kind of the interplay between those two, just having all these institutions come together. No, no, uh, you know, it's fantastic. And it's to some extent reminding me, me of my own time uh, in Silicon Valley in the 1990s when uh, the semiconductor industry was on uh, the rise. And uh, like, you know, that was a time when personal computing was really seeing explosive growth. And many of the big tech companies that we see today uh, were just like, you know, coming uh, into play and coming off age. And I was working on something where it had just come out of the lab and uh, it was, we were, uh, my company Applied Materials was commercializing it. And um, like, you know, that's, that's like, you know, like uh, uh, it was really uh, fantastic because uh, there was a lot of interest. There was a lot of hype, like, you know, from the government, from the industry. And mm -hmm. as we uh, took it uh, uh, to um, like, you know, like uh, to the commercialization stage, Mm -hmm. uh, it became a lot more um, like you know there was a uh, clearly like you know like a lot of excitement because it was this transformational thing which was going to take uh, companies uh, for um, like you know and personal computing into the next domain from the micro technology uh, that existed uh -huh. before uh, yeah. more towards the nanotech uh, that uh, like you know happened later mm -hmm. so uh, yeah like you know, it uh, really did feel uh, like you know you were in the midst of something uh, fantastic that was going on in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That does sound pretty cool, actually. Um, okay, but uh, maybe a, a tough question for you then is why did you leave? I mean, you went to go do and do an MBA. So, so what's up with that? Yes, yes. So uh, I think it was probably more fear of missing out than anything else because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like, you know, I had, uh, I felt like you know, a little bit of a peer pressure to uh, follow what my friends were doing. And mm -hmm. uh, at that time, like, you know, the narrative seemed to be that if you uh, did your MBA and uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, you uh, worked uh, in the business string, then mm -hmm. you might just uh, rise faster. It might be like, you know, more of a commercial success and all of that, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think I probably gave in to that uh, rhetoric a little bit. Though my company, like, you know, like, you know we uh, did have managers who uh, dissuaded me a lot and they tried mm -hmm. to tell me don't do an MBA, but I think right. I probably had, uh, you know, I had my mind uh, fixated. But what do you and your friends see it as? Like, you know, is it an either or? What? Well, as in, like, you know, industry versus academia or business versus, uh, like, you know, like uh, research. Mm. Okay, uh, so those are two different, uh, two two parts to that. Um, industry versus academia, I mean, there is a distinction between them, of course. And I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it's different spaces for sure. Um, that said, uh, in quantum specifically, I know that a lot of professors actually run startups on the side. Um, my, my research advisor at Yale also, I mean, is part of a startup um, trying to commercialize this technology. And so, it does feel like it's not necessarily a binary choice anymore. Um, like there is maybe some scope to kind of work between them. Um, it's kind of what I was saying before about like all of these institutions coming together to um, I mean, create an ecosystem for, for quantum and, and this tech. 
And so, um, yeah, I, it doesn't seem like it's either or in that case. Um, and then business versus like science or research. Um, well, definitely, maybe not science, but tech is very, very lucrative these days. I mean, you just look at uh, most of the, the world's billionaires and like a lot of them are from tech, be it Elon Musk to, to Mark Zuckerberg. So, I don't know, it seems like also a financially good good bet to go into tech. And with like some of this other science that kind of intersects with tech, I, I see a similar, yeah, I guess similar mm. story. So as we uh, move into the next section, like you know, first uh, there is a question for the audience. Uh, did you have to make a choice at any point of time in your life uh, between career streams? And if yes, what were your choices? Mm -hmm. Right. So now uh, moving into the next section where we are really talking about like, you know, like, uh, okay, the opportunity space is there, but how mm -hmm. do we, uh, you know, create the interest and the, like, you know, the talent that is mm -hmm. needed. And one of the big uh, things that happens in, in any new area is that you do need the talent. And uh, from my perspective as an entrepreneur, like, and as I'm uh, like, you know, looking to hire uh, tech teams, mm -hmm. I do see that talent deficit and there is coding ability. Mm -hmm. But you know, we need more. We need the ability to structure problems. We need people mm -hmm. who are lateral thinkers, who are able to connect ideas, uh, take things mm -hmm. from other domain and bring them into like, you know, what we are doing to solve like, you know, something. And that's right. where I see like, you know, like uh, uh, there's something that seems to be like, you know, uh, missing. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, conversations, uh, like, you know, I do remember listening to, like, you know, with you, uh, we mm -hmm. had gone to TIFR to one of these uh, Chai and Vice sessions that they host. Yeah. And uh, Cedric oh. Villani, uh, you know, mm -hmm. he's a rock star mathematician, and uh, he was uh, an appeals medal winner. So he was there and, um, you know, he gave this fascinating talk on, uh, uh, well, like, you know, uh, math, but like, you know, a lot of other things, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, there on YouTube for whoever wants to see it. Uh, but uh, it was really talking about this idea of interconnection. Mm -hmm. And the fact that if you have interconnections, like, you know, that's what leads to innovation, that's what leads to disruption and creativity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way to do it is to like, you know, work with people from different domains or to right. bring in ideas from like, you know, different streams. So mm -hmm. is that something that you see? as you are working in research and innovation? Yeah, um, yeah, no, I definitely, I think I subscribe to that kind of, um, the importance of kind of working across disciplines. So quantum computing, the field that I'm in, um, is actually very interdisciplinary. So you um, obviously need some background in quantum physics to kind of get the basics. But um, I mean, you need computer scientists too, um, electrical engineers to kind of design chips, um, mechanical, engineers, um, like hardware and uh, microwave engineers, people do software, algorithms, design, and kind of use cases. So yeah, it's it's really cool to work in this space where you kind of get to meet so many people and like working on different aspects of, of a problem. Um, I guess um, in my own life, um, there, was this one, there was this one class I took at Yale, uh, which was a linguistics class called the Math of Language. Um, and I just took it for fun. I mean, I, I was thinking I might learn something cool about linguistics. Um, and then I, um, yeah, I, kind of midway through, through the course, they start talking about like how we can mathematically model um, the brain kind of as a computer. And actually we started talking about Turing machines, which um, I mean, if, you've, uh, if you know, or if you've seen, I guess, uh, the imitation game, yeah, um, come back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. A, a, a Turing machine is uh, it's basically the the basis for the rest of like all of computer science, and kind of the basis for a universal computer. And so, yeah, I went in thinking I would learn about linguistics, and then I came out with an understanding of um, this kind of concept in fundamental theoretical computer science, which is actually pretty relevant to what I'm what I'm doing. So. I mean, that that was one one experience with that. No, that's really like you know that's uh, uh, fascinating. I just love the idea of uh, uh, serendipity, 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, um, when I was in IIT, we had this requirement, IIT had the requirement that you had to do some a set of social sciences courses. So mm-hmm. I ended up doing a set of courses in the history of art. And mm-hmm. uh, the reason to go into it was, okay, well, it's going to be fun, it's going to be easy. Uh, mm-hmm. But then I uh, fell in love with, uh, like, you know, just like, you know, art and the whole notion of uh, art. And mm-hmm. almost a decade later, when I was writing my first book, a lot of that, like, you know, went into the book itself. And, um, and and then some years uh, back, uh, it so happened I was at a uh, like at a lit event, and I had gone in to listen to somebody else, but I just happened sure. to sit in the wrong room, and there was uh, you know the director of uh, the National Institute of Health uh, from Washington D.C., and he was talking a lot about like you know, his uh, field of medical research and uh, uh-huh. um, like uh, and somehow like you know like it was that one of those moments and. Uh, threads from that conversation, like you know, and like you know, it led me into a whole stream of research, of mm-hmm. uh, finding new things and uh, ideas from there. Actually, like you know, went into my uh, second book. So I just love these, like you know, like these moments, uh, like you know, these lateral threads that you can pull into something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, you know, actually, uh, on that there is a poll for the audience. Uh, right. Was there a moment in your life when you went in to learn something, but you know, ended up learning something altogether different. So and, it, uh, let's and, hear from you on that. Yeah. And also, I guess, tell us uh, how that benefited you um, in, in your life. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one of the things, though, that we did not do at IIT uh, was um, so much of learning by doing, because this whole mm-hmm. notion of uh, projects and research was a lot more yeah. limited back then uh, yeah. than it is now. And I think it's very di- different for you at, uh, like, you know, in, in your college. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in terms of doing research projects, um, that's a fairly common thing. I mean, I myself, I've, I've worked in three labs now. And then I also worked for a year at a startup, kind of uh, balancing that with, with classes. Um, and this is not just me, right? Like all of my friends do the same thing as well. They have done research at multiple places or in, interned at a tech company. So, I mean, it's becoming more common, I think. Um, definitely like access varies from, from place to place. But yeah, I think this idea of learning by doing and kind of project-based learning, it's it's catching on. I think a lot a lot of people are kind of subscribing to that. Yeah, and I think you did uh, like you know get an early start with it uh, with uh, uh, at TIFR at their uh, quantum lab with uh, Professor Vijay. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, but uh, for the audience, I guess. So I had the the very good fortune of being able to work in a quantum computing research lab at the age of sixteen, um, and I mean, yeah, that was a very very positive experience in my life. I mean, as as you know. Um, I mean, Vijay became a mentor, um, really helped me kind of learn about quantum physics, quantum mechanics. Um, Yeah, and I mean, just having a mentor to kind of guide me through like a project and like get me interested in the field, that was really helpful, um, I think. Mm. And uh, so you think uh, that experience uh, shaped your life to some extent? Well, uh, so I, I worked in, in that lab for two years in high school, and then now I'm about ready to do that for the rest of my life. So, yeah, you could say that it um, that it impacted my life. Now, you know, that's uh, really fantastic because uh, uh, those experiences that you get with close mentorship, like, you know, can mm-hmm. really, like, you know, impact uh, uh, your own learning and your own, right. like, you know, sort of understanding of an area. And uh, sometimes, like you know, it goes both ways because I uh, sit in the other hat of uh, uh, being a mentor to the interns, for example, like you know, who join uh, Gaia. And mm-hmm. uh, it uh, really, it's a two-way street because if the intern is really interested in what they're doing and what mm-hmm. uh, efforts they're putting in, then we also get very interested in working with them. Right. And at the same time, like you know, there's the flip experience where um, for your sister Ishani, like you know, and she's really interested in a very different set of streams in biology. And uh, we've tried, like you know, reaching out to professors, uh, mm-hmm. and um, 
you know, uh, it's not that easy actually because not mm-hmm. everybody is interested in uh, spending that time. So in that sense, it was really lucky that, uh, like, you know, uh, Professor Vijay was there. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we need and like, you know, like, uh, like TIFR, like, you know, the Chai and Y and all of that, there's the Homi Baba Center of Science Education at mm-hmm. TIFR. And that too is doing so much of uh, advocacy to bring in people at a younger age. Right. Uh, they have programs for middle school kids, which you did, which Ashani did, mm-hmm. right? And uh, yeah, like uh, that advocacy yeah. is really needed. I, I agree, yeah. You think, and, and you're doing a lot of it in uh, the US as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, as part of the club that I lead, which is the Society of Physics Students, Uh, We're actually in the process of starting an outreach program for kind of high schools um, uh, in and around Yale. Um, Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's a great thing to be a part of because, I mean, these kids kind of can get access to professors, to labs, and kind of you can build up this interest in science, which, I mean, it's so crucial to get people interested in science at at an early age. Um, And then also, like, give them... Like there are like tips and tricks to this. And I think if you can kind of have that experience with kids and kind of um, show them the path, then I mean, they are also excited to kind of follow along that and and then actually go into science or or whatever. Yeah. Mm. And I think even companies are trying a lot, right? Like, you know, to bring uh, younger people into uh, the domain of technology. Mm Um, yeah. No, for sure. Um, I think companies generally are pretty invested in education. I mean, I know Google is now creating its own like certificate to, to replace university courses and whatnot. Yeah. Um, then in quantum computing specifically, uh, IBM actually just did a global summer school, which had 5,000 people around the world sign up and just come to do homework sessions and learn about quantum computing and actually play with the IBM systems via the cloud. And so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of unprecedented um, for this space. And I, I think people are kind of interested in bringing, bringing kids and bringing others kind of into the fold. Um, and I, I'm also actually, um, separate from that, I'm involved with a similar initiative, actually. So uh, with a couple of friends at MIT, um, we're actually putting together a, a course, uh, a year-long course, which is a quantum computing high school curriculum for high schools uh, for high school students um, and yeah and we're, we're really hoping that it can kind of reach a large number of kids and kind of get them interested in this space mm. and that uh, like you know that coding school is also like you know uh, it has uh, funding from IBM right um, TBD yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh, but uh, you know so uh, what's uh, critical is like you know that uh, we need more and more resources to uh, attract uh, younger and younger students into Mm -hmm. uh, the fold of science because there are certain foundational, um, I guess, ways and uh, like an interest that you need at a certain age before you uh, get into that path. And Mm -hmm. what I find interesting is that, uh, you know, there are some templated courses Right, like you know, mm-hmm. where you're taught, like you know, very methodically, like you know, okay, do this, do that, and then reach an outcome. But what okay. is more critical is the non-templated resources, right, which yeah. are very, very few, where mm-hmm. you get a chance to explore and to stretch and to sort of like you know, experiment and try different mm-hmm. things and uh, you know, read up and interlink, right. Uh, so that, right. Uh, like you know, so, uh, places like the AFR, places like Omi Baba Institute, like you know, like those mm-hmm. are the ones that are really needed uh, and mentorship uh, you know like i mean i guess if i look back on my own life mm-hmm. uh, even in iit or in berkeley somehow the mentors that i found uh, were more interested in things beyond technology so perhaps mm-hmm. like you know that uh, ended up shaping like you know my journey and my choices into mm-hmm. uh, what i did but right. uh, like you know let's uh, like you know switch gears a little bit more towards uh, uh, the earlier part of life, like, you know, when did you, like, you know, uh, start liking science? Uh, uh, So I think, uh, I think it was around grade seven or eight, I think. Um, That was around the time that they, they introduced physics and chemistry for the first time at at our school. And yeah, we had, we had some really great teachers, actually. So um, I I remember my seventh grade physics teacher, Ms. Preeti, 
Um, and she was fantastic. And she actually, she would go through the syllabus a bit. And then I think the rest of the class period, she would just spend talking about stuff completely out of the syllabus. I mean, she would tell us about like black holes and, and antimatter and oh, what was going on at CERN. And like, it would just be like a question and answer session and she could like have those conversations with us. Um, and I think that, that, that class, I think got me interested in kind of reading on my own. I mean, just like going on Wikipedia and like learning about something, anything. Um, and I think after that, I also started to read books, watch documentaries. But yeah, I think it, it really came down to having having a teacher like that. And I mean, if, if you've had a teacher like that, you'll you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah. No, no, it's, it's, it's really important, like, you know, to have, uh, because teachers can make or break your interest in the subject. And, uh, yeah. you know, there was a uh, research done by um, um, JPAL, like in a poverty action lab, where uh, they were doing all these randomized control trials on education in, like, in a different, uh, uh, like, in a ways. And what they uh, found was that the most critical factor in, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, the a child's learning outcome is really the quality of teaching and the enthusiasm of the teacher, right? Like, you know, that yeah. has, uh, like, a huge amount of impact. So there's, like, you know, a question for the audience. Uh, do you remember a teacher who contributed to your life? And if so, let's acknowledge them. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely teachers, I think, play a crucial role. Um, and I think, I guess, shout out to not just my seventh grade teachers, but I guess all of my teachers throughout middle school, high school, and then college even. Um, I mean, I've been very fortunate, I think, to have these great teachers that were, I mean, even in things like literature and economics, uh, when I did classes in these things, they were always willing to kind of talk about the subject, not just, you know, uh, stick to the syllabus, but kind of engage interest in, in, in the subject. Um, even professors at Yale, I mean, I've had uh, go to a professor's office on a Friday afternoon and uh, in my case, it was learn about quantum, but yeah, just have that conversation. Um, yeah, I guess like once when, once you start to get interested, um, your enthusiasm kind of helps helps the teacher be enthusiastic. And if you you're showing that, I mean, you're interested in a in a subject, and uh, the teachers are good teachers, I mean, they'll kind of be able to help you that way. I think. No, no, absolutely. Like, you know, it's uh, really, uh, like, you know, critical, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. The role of teachers. Yeah. But, um, you know, besides teachers, I think you and dad, like, uh, at home also played a huge role in, I guess, getting me interested in science. I mean, so, I mean, I would read a lot about stuff and then I would just tell you guys and you guys were willing to listen and um, where you could, like, point me in a direction or tell me what to read or just kind of have that discussion, just be interested in what I was interested in. I think that that was very helpful for me, I think. Yeah, I do actually recall that phase, uh, you know, once your basic interest had uh, cemented in uh, sort of the broad area of science. And uh, we had a lot of like, you know, really fun conversations at home, like, you know, on music and math and the projects that you were doing and right. like, you know, in that domain and factual theory and neural networks and like, you know, like uh, the pattern of languages and whatnot, right? And I, I think I, uh, in that phase, uh, possibly in your high school, I have read more science history books than I did in my own engineering days. So like, you know, just, just to keep up uh, and uh, like, you know, stay engaged. And mm -hmm. I remember like, you know, we watched a lot of uh, movies and shows, uh, not just the imitation game, but uh, uh, Big Bang Theory and House and like, you know, like a whole bunch of like, you know, like Doctor Who. Uh, yeah. think, uh, as a family, like, you know, we watched a lot of like, you know, like uh, science and science related uh, things. Science fiction. At that yeah. Time. yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess definitely just like being interested. I mean, I was interested in these things and you guys weren't like, no, don't do that. Um, it was kind of, in a sense, complimentary to, I mean, reading up about science a bit. So. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's it's, it's like uh, being like you know, in the middle of like you know like an um, immersive experience, and that mm -hmm. uh, uh, really helps uh, cement you know, the entire uh, 
enjoyment, it, right? Like, you know, that, that's the thing that it, uh, if you enjoy it, it, it uh, then, like, you know, you stay in the game. Yeah. You know, that, that really did help. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. thanks for such an engaging discussion. You know, I think I'm going to go and rewatch the imitation game, hearing you guys speak about their Turing machine and then the film just reminded me of uh, what a good film it is. As you can see from all the comments coming in from our audience, uh, you know, your uh, conversation has really inspired some people, especially a question about teachers. We're seeing uh, people in our audience give a quick shout out to some of their favorite teachers, which is great. Mm -hmm. So before I go to an audience question, I want to just stay on that topic and pose a question uh, to both of you. Amrita, I'll come to you first, which is, you know, you talked about how you saw Shomik's learning process growing up which actively happened in the age of the internet. But how was your own experience perhaps different? And can you speak to the role of books and the role that books play in learning, both back then and even today? Absolutely, absolutely. So obviously, like, you know, uh, there was no internet when I was growing up, but we had uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> which uh, was like you know the uh, like an you know, internet of those days, and I do remember like you know, it was like you know, the entire set uh, is it's quite an expensive uh, investment to make, but uh, my parents uh, like you know they uh, felt that it was one of those things that they had to invest in for the kids, and like you know there was this big uh, uh, set of those uh, red books uh, which was there in our uh, like in a house, and I made good use of it, and uh, we always had like you know, in my house uh, I had access to many many. Uh, uh, books all the time. So from my father's uh, medical books to my mom's psychology books to a lot of fiction and nonfiction and everything in between. And I think I read uh, widely. I read a lot. And uh, what happens with reading is that, uh, you know, it's uh, important to learn how to synthesize because information is there. But what is important is how do you synthesize it? How do you interlink ideas like, you know, that whole interconnection? And mm -hmm. that, I think, like, you know, comes from reading widely. And mm -hmm. I'm always thankful, like, you know, to have... Uh, had access to books and even today like you know even today uh while there is directed information on the internet i think mm -hmm. the uh you know the, the the real thrill comes from like you know okay like you know, how do you actually link one concept with another concept and uh, get a larger and a um, you know wider understanding of whatever it is that you're reading about yeah no, thanks. Th thanks for sharing that. And I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. So but we're going to quickly take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Shamik, this one is for you from Shama Shah, who asks, you know, of course, you had an interest in the sciences, but with right. so many interesting areas to choose from. How did you pick your field? How did you pick one, the field of quantum? That that is a great question, actually, because there's so many cool things to work on today, um, be it from Maybe this is a bit of a preface, but yeah, I mean, to me, I think like uh, space, space stuff, SpaceX, um, to like AI, artificial intelligence, um, and quantum computing are among like to me are seem like some of the coolest things. Um, and there's like a whole bunch of like tech related and non tech related things that I mean I was interested in growing up. Um, I think to answer the question directly, uh, it. I mean, I kind of saw this space and kind of there's a lot of excitement with it and a lot of people are kind of seeing it emerge. It's like at a very crucial point. And so I felt that kind of getting into this space, I would also be able in some small way to like contribute to that. And um, it's cool. I, I mean, I, I fell in love with physics early and it's kind of doing what I love. Great. Uh, that's, that's good to hear. And, uh... Uh, another question, and uh, Amit, I'll come back to you for this one. Shavan Bhatt, who's a TMG alum at this point, he mm -hmm. asks, and first Amrita, then uh, Shamik, which is, are there any issues on quantum computing or its uses that both of you disagree on in terms of application? Let's, I mean, even expanding it to uh, the frontier Dis sciences. Wait, when you say disagree, you mean disagree on whether it's possible or disagree whether it should be should be done? Let's take the latter one. I think that is a little more. Should be done. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, frontier science, so not just quantum. Yeah. Um, okay, this morning I was watching Elon Musk present about Neuralink. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but it's his, uh, his new startup. 
which basically they they put a chip in your brain and then they can it's like a fitbit in your brain it can measure yeah. your brain activity and then like predict how you're going to move predict your mood like do all of this stuff and then also like improve it with careful electrical signals in your brain um to kind of like uh stimulate the brain because the brain as you know it's it's made of neurons and um i mean these are just electrical impulses and so if you can measure that and control it then you can actually solve some problems there and i mean it's super cool at the same time it's like really creepy it's like out of black mirror or something or like you can like read inside someone's brain so yeah there i'm i err on the side of should we be doing this or not um yeah that was maybe a yeah. tangent uh so i we we still have a lot of questions from our audience but only so mm -hmm. much time to go through but don't worry uh amrita and shomik will be answering all of your questions on our slack channel so please mm -hmm. come over over there we'll take your questions from facebook as well as continue continue this conversation um mm -hmm. on such an interesting topic over on our slack channel the details of which are over here mm -hmm. uh, so as i promised uh here's what we have uh, for you on talking about my generation next week mm -hmm. so during the first week first six episodes of TMG we've explored a range of issues from shopping entertainment starting up and money so for our next episode as you can see from our poster here we've picked yet another theme family business where you get to meet Deepa Soman and her daughter Ria Deepa is the founder and CEO of Lumia Business Solutions a boutique research consulting and design firm with a very distinctive identity and philosophy two and a half years ago her daughter Ria stepped into Lumiere to kickstart a new design practice. And this is their story of how they learned to work together as colleagues, taking Lumiere to the next level. In doing so, they had to make sure they understood each other's strengths and how to leverage it. So please join us. Don't miss their special story next, um, as it comes out through Ria's column and Deepa's uh, audiogram next week, followed by the live show, as always, on Saturday, September 5th at 7.30 p.m. India time. So for now, I would like to say a big thank you to the Chaudhrys and to all of you in our audience. I wish a very good weekend. Take care and goodbye. Bye. Bye. See you.